I can't hear someone play the banjo on radio or on TV or in a movie or something without wanting to get up and go get my banjo and play a little bit. And that's the kind of addiction that I have. I had a period where I learned how to play Bach on the banjo. Bach sounded really good on the banjo. If he'd ever heard one, he'd have written for it. I'm convinced of it. Why did I love the banjo? I didn't at first. I didn't. I thought it was a clunky instrument. I mean, I was a piano student before I went to high school. And the piano had such a lovely sound, I thought. And uh, then I took a, a little guitar, because it was hard to take pianos to parties in high school, but it was easy to take a guitar. And then the Kingston Trio came out with some of their songs, Tom Dooley, the first one, of course, that interested me that the banjo was in there. And I thought, well, maybe it's not so bad as I thought. It's kind of a fun song. And then they came out right away after that with the song, The MTA, in which the banjoist David Gard used a three-finger style and played rapidly, just wonderful. And I thought, you can get that wonderful sound out of a banjo, huh? And I thought, oh, wow. I loved the banjo, but I didn't get one until I went off to college. My dad told me that he thought I liked the banjo because it was a challenge to get those wonderful sounds out of it. And he was right. It was a challenge, you know. And it, it was something that I could see myself doing so that when I went off to college and the guy was sitting out front of the student union building playing a banjo, and I sat down next to him and said, that's neat, it's a five string. He said, yeah, and it's for sale. And I thought, well, there goes my accumulative ratio for the first year of college, right there. I said, how much do we want for it? And he told me, and I called my dad, and he said, write him a check, and I did. And that was the beginning of the end for me, <laughs> or the beginning of the beginning, actually. <laughs> the most beautiful sound a banjo can make is one that plays a melody pretty clearly through without too much or ornamentation and without too much hard playing of the fingers and so on. You have to find the soul of the instrument. That's what's hard sometimes. People think, well, I'll get this really expensive model and I'll play well. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Some of the banjos that I have, uh, the old Morrison, no longer made, of course, it uh, doesn't have much going for it, so you have to find out how to make that come out and to make it melodious and clear and ringing and singing. That's what I like to hear a banjo do, sing. Here we have a Morrison banjo made toward the end of the 19th century, reflecting frets as position markers, lovelier inlays, sweeter sounds, and a gentler playing style. Three fingers. And here's a tune from New Mexico, 1865 actually, called Calabra. I think I started getting pretty good at it by, oh, well, I started playing it in 1961, and I started getting to what I considered pretty good around 1980. I could play it before that, but I was playing how other people played things a lot of the time. And then when I had to figure out how I wanted to play things, well, I wanted to get the idea of the melody and, and, and yet make it something that was a good feeling inside me. It wasn't just a technical masterpiece or something like that. After you learn the mechanics, left, right hand, string size, once you get to where you seem to know what you're doing, mechanically, then you have everything you need to produce what you feel. 
And I try, in all of the arrangements I've done with the various bands that I've played, I have tried to get a soulful, not mournful, but soulful, a ringing and emotional response to it. Some of them are just wild songs, wild tunes, and you still have to capture that wildness. Not just play harder or wacky. You have to capture that kind of great driving enthusiasm the same as you might have to capture the gentleness of a song. Not all banjo songs have to be bluegrassy or even four-string Dixielandy. There are a lot of wonderful songs out there, tunes out there. Bella Fleck has discovered how to do that very wonderfully, I think. And there are many other good musicians that can play music on the banjo, not banjo on the banjo. This banjo is made from a gourd and a rather stylized neck. Probably wouldn't have been so fancy. It was modeled after a slave banjo made before, say, 1850. I wrote my doctoral thesis on the banjo, but before I wrote it, I had to learn how to play all the styles I was discussing and describing. And I did, and that minstrel style took me five years to just get where it was because there are no frets on that banjo and I had to figure out how hard do I play can I make it sing can I make it this little sound oh that's nice we have a banjo here that was made by William Boucher around 1850 not this one this is a copy of it but this is exactly the way Boucher made them and he was a furniture maker and this made the banjo now, unlike the gourd banjo, mass produced and it's set a standard for the minstrel shows. And a guy asked if I'd be interested in, uh, in playing in a Dixieland band that he had. And I said, sure. And I started out, it was kind of rough at first because I wasn't used to the harmonic differences. But then I thought, Wayne, you know when you played piano, you love the chords. Now you get to play chords like this in a strum style on banjo. And they have such a wonderful sound, you know. Well, that only took another 10 years. But you get to where you like what you're doing, see? because it sounds good. I think Pete Seeger demonstrated that you could play the banjo in any number of styles, but there was always a soul behind every note you played. And he played the banjo on, on top of Old Smokey and Irene Goodnight, and everything worked. And that's how you find the soul of the instrument. I think from the first time I strummed the darn thing, I knew this was it. 